September 9th, 2022, London. Every billboard in the city is covered in pictures of Queen Elizabeth II. Every single one. I had sort of prepared for a couple, but there's just sheer number and the pervasiveness is just staggering. The next day I'll return to Liverpool where the monarch sent the pro monarchy sentiment is much less visible to s s well that's an understatement the same thing every billboard covered in images of the dead queen both of these cities long histories of anti-monarchist struggle along histories of poverty and mistreatment of poor and minority communities proud socialist histories some of them especially liverpool and there's something very strange about every surface of these two cities being covered in pictures of this dead rich woman when the scars of her reign are still so visible and when you can easily find images of say homeless people sleeping next to a billboard which has been turned into a tribute to her. People of Britain, we have reached the end of an era. The Queen is dead. God clearly hates to see a girl boss winning, and so he sent his foremost demon, Elizabeth Pork Market's Trust, to give her the kiss of death. While our new PM enjoys the fruits of our most recent murder, the country faces a stark situation. The throne of England is empty. It's next in line. A man named Charles coming to the throne at a time of national crisis. As those of you with a passing knowledge of English history might be aware, kings named Charles don't have a particularly spotless record in this country, and indeed there are probably many on the ground already wishing to skip to the part where the Queen's least problematic son gets the shortest haircut of his life. But we aren't here today to wish the prince ill. The time to judge Charles will come. But for now, we must think about his mother, the Queen. The last person alive Britain didn't unanimously detest. What does her death mean for the country? Queen Elizabeth II. The sequel no one asked for. Born into a family of the richest people on planet Earth, descended from Odin himself, and dressed head to toe in all of the ice she stole from her haters, today we look back at the life of the original girl boss. From her humble origins as a super rich cousin fucker, to her death as a relic of a bygone era, Elizabeth Windsor, known by the gamertag QE2, lived a life of total notoriety. Love her, or hate her, you all knew her, and she looked at you every day, from your money, which she kindly let you borrow from her personal collection of stolen wealth. What can we learn about the Queen now she has passed? What historical lessons can we take from her 75-year reign as a monarch of Normal Island and the places it bleed into being part of its empire? Can we infer something profound about the nature of Britain itself from the death of this great woman? And do we want this weird guy sitting in a chair? Now, I know he's a son, but her other son is a nonce, so it's not like we should be giving everyone a free pass because they passed through the royal vagina. Sorry, late royal vagina. This is a retrospective on Liz, 
Um, this is also, more importantly, the Empire Statement. Thrust into the role of Queen following the end of the Second World War in which her uncle's side lost, Queen Elizabeth II immediately set out about making her mark on the world by one, not abolishing her station, this perpetuating the monarchy for another 75 long years, and two, immediately going around the world to try and convince friends and family of the millions of people Britain had slaughtered in the name of the Empire to stay around and keep giving the mother country their sweet, sweet riches. Including in Kenya, where the British held millions in concentration camps. You can argue about Queen Elizabeth the person all you want, but Queen Elizabeth the, uh, the, the Queen presided over some pretty brutal crimes against humanity, including the genocides of multiple nations in the Global South. Now, obviously she didn't do this alone, but the idea that the literal Queen couldn't have had an impact on this policy is naive to say the least. Queen Elizabeth always had the choice to step down, to speak out, to influence public opinion, and further. And not only did she not choose to, she actively took a role in suppressing the peoples of the world who are fighting and dying to free themselves of British colonial rule. Whether you think of her as the nation's grandma or not, if my grandma had looked the other way while my family had killed millions, I wouldn't quite be able to look at her the same way afterwards. So why can we look past this stuff? Why do so many of us find it not only easy but comforting to look past this stuff? Why do we find it so easy to see the old woman in the expensive chair? when the woman who stood in front of us for 75 years had the blood of a third of the world on her hands. Well, I have a little theory about this, and for me this really defines both the way Britain and the world feels about Elizabeth II. Because despite all evidence of her misdeeds, and that's really not a strong enough word for what she presided over, she had impeccable PR. Elizabeth II was both the product and the owner of the image in our heads of her. Elizabeth II was the first and possibly last mass media monarch. Her image, finely curated. The parts we see, completely cherry picked. And the things we don't, we don't feel like we miss anything because we feel like we have so much access to her. It's easy to ignore even horrific things when you can't see them. Plus, I think it makes people uncomfortable to think that they have fond feelings towards a massive genocidal racist, but yeah, mass media monarch. So let's run with that. A lot of hay has been made in the last few years about the idea of parasocial relationships, especially since the rise of YouTube celebrity and other such figures, for whom the appeal to their audience is the feeling of actually knowing someone. When you listen to a podcast that is a bunch of friends talking, you feel like part of that friend group, and you feel as if part of you, at least on some level, knows them. Even if intellectually we can reason with ourselves that all we see is a performance, there is an appeal in that illusion of closeness and familiarity which is quite hard to deny, and genuinely I don't think there is a better example of a parasocial relationship that predates the internet age than the relationship of the people of the United Kingdom to the performance and the curated image of Elizabeth II. When people think of Queen Elizabeth II, they don't think about a person that oversaw brutal genocides or oppressions and crackdowns. They think of Queen Elizabeth the influencer. The image of Britain, hands clean, head held high, and always at your side. While many will only have become familiar with this kind of one-sided relationship dynamic with the rise of personal vlogs and other similarly intimate forms of art, in the United Kingdom the Queen's coronation was the driving force behind a lot of the initial sales of television in the first place. Her coronation was the first major event most people had ever seen. Synonymous with their first experience of mass media in general. Never before had the country had such direct access to its monarch, and this set the standard for its relationship to her. Queen Elizabeth was the great British spectacle, the finely curated image of mass media, and as mass media evolved, so did she, evolving with it. The level of access was unprecedented. 
and the level of technological leap it represented really represented a sea change in how a head of state could even be represented. The British public were made to feel as if they knew this figure, this queen. Not the real woman, but the queen of television, of the coronation, of the queen's speech, and of the image and the money. All of this was cohesive and deliberate. The real person behind this, and the atrocities she actively played a part in, they weren't part of this vision. They were not to be seen in the parasocial version of the Queen. No flaw was to be presented. And I think it is hard for people who fully bought in to this finely curated and excellently crafted parasocial relationship to marry that person they feel like they knew with the reality of a woman who signed off on concentration camps, death squads, cover-ups of sex crimes and worse. That's not the Queen they knew and they're right. They didn't know her. But they knew the influencer that was the Queen. Theirs was a one-sided relationship with a public relations mascot, and that's not their fault. The image of the Queen was built that way on purpose. To reimagine that? To come to terms with the fact that your parasocial relationship with this archetypical figure of the elderly wise woman being but a mirage is the sort of thing that can really break someone's brain. But the fact remains that we should try. If for no other reason than to honour the memory of the thousands around the world who can no longer speak because of her actions. To pretend they don't exist to spare the feelings of those who cannot adjust to new information is unacceptable. You may lose a connection you felt to a woman who has passed, but it is much more important to remember the dead in Nigeria, Kenya, India, Ireland and many other countries whose blood need not have been shed and could have lived, if not for the action, or inaction, depending on the case, of one late woman. For as much as we need to understand the media lie of the Queen to reckon with how the world reacts to her death, to come to terms with her actual legacy, it is necessary to deconstruct that. To go beyond the image of the Queen that many of us would rather remember, and remember the actual woman, Elizabeth Windsor, warts and all. Although, even I could admit that as someone who grew up with images of the Queen all around me, separating the woman from the propaganda is extremely difficult. Elizabeth's image is everywhere, and not just because every billboard in the UK now has a face plastered across it. She's on money, on stamps, on post boxes, on Every spare surface you can think of in a way the British press criticises a cult when it's repeated in another country. Her image is synonymous with modern Britain, and perhaps modern Britain will struggle to survive with a cohesive identity without her. I, I doubt it, but perhaps her image is, after all, nothing if not pervasive. From the televised coronation to the crown on Netflix, Elizabeth II lived a life of spectacle. And her job within that spectacle was to give the impression of a country united around one universally beloved figure. Importantly, those who control the narrative control the conversation around it. Even those who detest the monarchy find it hard to deny the spell it's cast over the British public. Every time there's a royal event on TV, we go live to a bunch of weeping commoners who have fallen helplessly in love with this old woman in an expensive hat. And the way this media is presented to us makes us feel like this is more common than it probably actually is. You're hardly going to get Republican rallies airing on the BBC. Yet one side of this issue, the monarchist side, has enjoyed free and barely uninterrupted coverage for every event they deign to touch. Support for the monarchy is framed as the neutral position. The normal, the sensible, the default. How then can we even begin to make sense of the idea that the Queen might not have been a perfect being? As the country goes from arguing about one thing to another until they're red in the face, at the end of the day, cameras on or off, there's always one thing they agree on, at least in theory. Love for the Queen, or so the narrative goes. This illusion of unity has served the country well for decades. We can all agree what the nature of Britain is, even if we aren't a fan of it, right? Well, that hasn't really been true since the Brexit vote, if it ever was. And these days, trust in mainstream media sources is at an all-time low. 
So even if the media wish to manufacture some sort of consent around this, it might struggle. For now, the inertia of decades of the Queen's popularity, her ageing with the first television and then the internet has all come quite naturally. But there isn't a similarly new role for King Charles III to fall into. There was a place in the British consciousness for the Queen, one she forged herself, and one birthed through the magic of television and a mass media spectacle. Charles does not have such luxury. He's from a bygone era, but he's not wedded to it in the same way the Queen was. He isn't part of the fabric of the British media, and what's more, he's not only wildly unpopular in comparison to his mother, but he's coming to the throne in an era of anti-politics, where the status quo is clearly broken, and people are increasingly unhappy with the current order. Not a good position in which to end up when you have a crown on your head. If I may wildly speculate for a second, one of the endearing legacies of Queen Elizabeth II and the media environment that created the mystique around her may well be that no one ever manages to recreate her reign. Charles might well be safest to begin his reign by abolishing the monarchy altogether rather than try and catch lightning in a bottle twice. Unless the entire media escape changes dramatically for a third time in a century and Charles manages to ride that wave, it seems very unlikely that King Charles III will become as ubiquitous and enduring a figure as his late mother, the Queen Elizabeth II. And that is just the image of the Queen we're talking about. As an actual historical figure, there are people in many, many countries who would like a word, or reparations, or their country back, as the case may be. Don't forget that when Elizabeth first inherited the crown, the British Empire was the British Empire. And it's not like she was just sitting there shaking her head and muttering, what are you like, during the Bengal famine, the onset of apartheid in South Africa, the Mau Mau rebellion, or even something quite close to home, like the treatment of Virginia Giuffre by her son Prince Andrew, whose legal fees she paid personally so that he wouldn't have to face trial in the US for one of the worst crimes imaginable. Now, we all have our soft spots for family, but I think with most people, Literal sex trafficking is a crime you can't look past, and I'm genuinely surprised that people seem to give her a pass on this while condemning Andrew, as if her involvement is not central to him avoiding criminal charges. You can find pictures of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell having a grand old time at Buckingham Palace. The Queen quite obviously didn't care that this stuff was happening. Now, is that something your nan would do? No. Your nan, I imagine would not cover up a child sex trafficking ring for her nonce son while trying to distract the world from the fact that your family personally pillaged over a third of the surface of the planet. Give your nan more credit. If you're still scratching your head, wondering what it is the nice old bejeweled grandma did to deserve my scorn, I've got a couple of videos I would recommend you watch. There are a bunch of great videos on the British Empire and other related subjects, but just off the top of my head here, um, I would really recommend you watch uh, Wine and Chill's excellent video on Queen Elizabeth and the rest of her work to the Colonizer Exposed series, really top-notch shit. The video by Mayowa's work called Please Release the Hold the Royal Family Has on Us, which you would recommend. Also, um, as a primer for a lot of people in the UK especially, seem to not know a whole lot about what happened in Ireland and why um, the Irish might have such a grudge against the English and our royal family. I'd really recommend you watch A Troubled History of Northern Ireland by the Leftist Cooks. Um, you've probably already seen it, if you've seen this channel, but uh, all of those worth a watch. Um, all of them really good. Queen Elizabeth, while certainly dead, was not a good person. And it shouldn't be controversial to say that. But I think we've been taught by a barrage of media influencers to see her as a comfy, if problematic, figure that even the most critical of us tend to downplay the worst sides of, especially in mixed company. No matter her crimes, and there were some fucking corkers, we all know that someone in the room at any time sees the Queen as part of the comforting image of home. They shouldn't. But that's what the mass media and landscape in Britain was built around. We learn to watch the Queen on TV, to see her on her money, to be used to her as part of the furniture. The woman we saw on TV? 
she's the same woman who presided over the Mau Mau Rebellion and other horrific massacres. But that wasn't the narrative we were fed. It feels wrong. It feels off. It's not the relationship we had to her. That's not the image of the queen we were sold. But it is the real her. And I think we should remember that before we tell people in the global south they're wrong to not mourn her. There are people still alive today who were beaten, raped and killed by the British crown. That doesn't change who the queen was. But perhaps it should change how you think about her. How you remember her. Instead of remembering the comfortable lie England was sold. And in case you're still sitting here in denial, let me read the words of Dr. Uju Anya. And once you hear them, take a second and think about whether they change your opinion of the Queen. And if not, then why not? I am the child and sibling of survivors of genocide. From 1967 to 1970, more than three million civilians were massacred when the Igbo people of Nigeria tried to form the independent nation of Biafra. Those slaughtered innocent members of my family. I was born in the immediate aftermath of this genocide, which was directly supported and facilitated by the British government, then headed by the monarch Queen Elizabeth II. This support came through political cover, weapons, bombs, planes, military vehicles, and supplies the British government sent to kill us and protect their interests in the oil reserves on our land. My people endured a holocaust, which has shadowed our entire lives and continues to affect it, because we're still mourning incalculable losses and still rebuilding everything that was destroyed. Conversations among us today include who was lost, who was displaced, where people ran, where bodies are buried. They do not include kind, respectful, or temperate sentiments about the people who murdered our relatives and destroyed our lives. Some may not approve of how a survivor of state violence expresses their opinion of those who harmed them, but all should know that colonizer is not an abstract word to me, nor is the blood-soaked legacy of Queen Elizabeth II and the British monarchy something I've only read about in history books. Hey, thanks for watching. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not back on my face. <laughs> Amazing. Um, my face isn't back on screen yet. It's still doing some healing. Um, I had facial surgery not too long ago and I'm still recovering. Um, some of the days have been a bit messy. Um, I'm on the mend slowly but surely. Um, but here I am with another video because the Queen died and I had thoughts. And really, I've got a lot written and I just I enjoy making these. So... Thanks for all your support, if you're here. Um, if you enjoy it, uh, please like, subscribe. Um, helps the channel out. Share with your friends, please. Uh, especially if one of your friends has the ability to boost my content. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, please subscribe to my Patreon if you um, have some spare cash. Or if you just feel generous. Uh, you can go to coffee.com as well, slash Bridget Empire. Or patreon.com slash Bridget Empire. That's B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E. E-M-P-I-R-E, -E, and I will put my face back in front of your screen soon, um, and we can develop that parasocial relationship that we once had with the Queen, but this time with me, a transsexual. Um, yeah, hi, uh, patrons. I love you. You're all cool as fuck. Um, my patrons, so far, are the coolest people on the planet, and those their names are Scarjan, Joey Cobalt, and Naomi Wayne. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for all your support so far. I am in love with you. And uh, don't know why they said that in the Matt Berry voice. Maybe that's just how I'm going to end up doing this from now on. Just slowly morph into Matt Berry. I am in love with you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, please share. Please subscribe. Uh, have a think about the Patreon and... Uh, yeah, the Queen 
complicated. Yeah. Not 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 a hundred percent sure that she was the best person on earth, uh, especially because of the killings. Um, but also, I understand why people have complicated feelings, and I enjoy nuance. Please watch those other videos I recommended. They are very good. Thank you and bye. I love you.